The Lord be with you. Well, hello there, my dear ones, and welcome to the weekly vlog. I'm so thankful for all of you who tune in week on week, especially those who like, comment and share because that helps us grow the mission and ministry of this little channel and to the folks who contribute on the live chat every week. I so enjoy and look forward to interacting with you guys and what a wonderful community God has drawn together in this online space. Certainly proves to me that not everything about the internet is bad, that God can use it for good. We have some very varied stories to cover this week and as we do week in and week out we're going to try and unpack these by looking at them through a biblical lens because it is the sole rule and authority of faith in the life of the Christian. So we want to be people of the Bible and we want to see how can we interpret what's going on around us uh, through the scripture. And so uh, I'm going to dive right in with our first story which is from the Church of England. Uh, this one is relating to living and love and faith, which we haven't heard a lot of lately, uh, which I like to call living and lust and fornication, which is, in case you're not aware, uh, if you're new to this channel or you've forgotten, because uh, who wouldn't want to forget it, uh, or you've been living under a rock, living and love and faith is, in fact, the process by which the Church of England has introduced homosexual blessings, uh, which, of course, we biblical Christians believe is anathema. It is a form of apostasy. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like me using those strongly worded kind of phrases, but I believe that's the biblical truth. Uh, and the Church of England has backslidden over a course of time, over a few decades, uh, because of lack of discipline and lack of courage from its leaders to stand up to error and progressive uh, false theology. Uh, and sadly, backsliding being a process took time, and bit by bit, it ended up in blessing something that God clearly defines as a sin. Defines as a sin. And if you look up the dictionary definition of apostasy, it says someone or a group of people who uh, walk away from or abandon core tenets of their religion. Well, I'd say it is a pretty core tenet of the Christian religion that marriage is for one man and one woman for life. And to walk away from that or abandon that is in fact uh, a form of apostatizing. So that is what has happened. That brings you up to speed. But it's been all quiet in the Western Front uh, since it was passed through General Synod. Um, and there was a little bit of a kerfuffle back in February where the Bishop of Newcastle, who was co-leader, there were two bishops leading the implementation of these gay blessings, the liturgies and the theology and all that behind it. Uh, and she had a bit of a paddy and spat the dummy and quit because uh, the Church of England had appointed some theological advisors uh, for this process, and one of them was a conservative evangelical, which is typical of progressive lefty liberal type people who have abandoned the scripture. Uh, they cannot stand having people who believe the Bible in positions of influence or authority. Uh, it's all love, tolerance, peace, love and mung beans, inclusion, and all that until somebody dares to stand up and say, hey, I disagree with you and I have a different view. And why can't I be included here? And so she left, she just left. Um, which meant that the bishop of my former diocese, uh, and the bishop of Leicester, Martin Snow, was left all alone. Uh, he released a series of requests quite publicly uh, to the archbishops of Canterbury and York, uh, which he wanted fulfilled if he was to continue in the role and to see LLF implemented. As far as I can tell, reading back over the stories from Feb, uh, he had... Uh, don't think his um, requests have been entirely fulfilled, uh, but they have now at least surrounded him with uh, a panel, um, a new board which has been created to support him in leading the living and love and faith process and the implementation of these uh, liturgical blessings for same-sex couples. Um, you know, even though I strongly disagree with this and I think it's unbiblical um, and it's one of the reasons why I left the Church of England, uh, I do empathize with my former bishop. It can't have been easy to be out on a limb like that. Uh, and the process, it seems to me from the outside looking in, has been uh, just a comedy of errors of very badly executed bureaucracy, uh, which the Church of England is notorious for. And so uh, that is why they've waited so long in order to implement a board to help execute this. The Archbishop of York has been appointed... Uh, as uh, he's announced this, but he's also been appointed as um, part of this board. 
Stephen Cottrell. Um, he's chairing the program board. He's, you know, he's as woke as they come. He's all in for the gay blessings. Uh, but, you know, fence sitting for those who, uh, you know, ostensibly oppose these things, which as far as I know, I think Bishop Snow does. He's a, he's a traditionalist in terms of his view of marriage. Uh, fence sitting is the, the order of the day for people in those positions of leadership who hold to a traditional view. There's a lot of them even voted in favor of introducing LLF, even though they personally say they don't agree with blessing same-sex marriages or they think that marriage is between one man and one woman. Because that's what the Church of England's become, this weird, muddling compromise, this fudge of ecclesiologies and theologies with very poor definition. But it has been seized by people uh, in the upper echelons of power who are radically opposed to the simple beliefs of the Bible and uh, 2,000 years of church history and tradition. <clears throat> so living in love and faith is going ahead is the, the, the long and the short of this. It hasn't gone away. It hasn't dissolved. I know many brothers who are still contending for the faith, many brother clergy and many laity who are still contending for the truth of the scripture in the Church of England. And I stand with you guys in prayer. I have a little list of beloved brothers whom I know and I connect with online um, and I pray for them quite often because it's very hard to contend for the truth uh, as the entire uh, organization starts to turn towards uh, apostasy and erroneous false teaching. And it must be very difficult to feel isolated in your little parish with your little flock who are staying true to God's word whilst the whole thing goes mad around you. And it is, I think, only a matter of time before the pressure is put on those people to go away. Um, to, to, to quit, to, to run. Yeah, GAFCON waits for you. That's what I would say. I have been very blessed by finding a GAFCON church home. Uh, I'm very thankful for the Free Church of England. I've fallen in love with its, uh, its doctrine as enshrined in the 56 Book of Common Prayer, its amended 39 articles, its declaration of principles. It is the reformed Protestant Anglican church that I always yearned for, and it stood firm for 170 years, which is quite astonishing. Uh, it's quite astonishing. So please pray for us uh, and the other branches of GAFCON in the UK, AMIE and ACE, who are also standing firm, contending for the truth of the scripture, uh, that the Lord would raise up um, a mighty army of Christians uh, in the Anglican tradition to, to show folks who are, are refugees or who are stuck in the CV wondering if there's a way out, God is working in the Anglican way of spirituality. He hasn't given up on us yet. Uh, as G.K. Chesterton said, the church has died many times, uh, but it comes back because it knows a God who rose from the dead. And it's always the enemies of the church that end up dead. And, you know, I think living in love and faith and the, the slow um, progression, you know, this slow march through the institution of progressivism and liberalism and the last 30 to 50 years in the C of E and in Methodism and in United Reformed Church here in the UK uh, and other mainline denominations, as our American friends would call them, that has uh, been um, part of God's judgment on bad leaders who didn't stand up to uh, false teaching. <clears throat> it's not sort of hellfire and brimstone, it's a slow rot. And uh, the remnant churches, the faithful churches, need to be aware of that as well. It's not... It's, not, it's, it's pretty obvious to see, oh, you know, we're not going to have any same-sex blessings because that's obviously unbiblical. But that's, that's pretty easy to ward off, I think, from the perspective of a continuing Anglican uh, context. What's more difficult to ward off is what Spurgeon warned about. Um, discernment is not knowing right from wrong, but right from almost right. Um, tiny, seemingly insignificant alterations in core doctrines, uh, which... I like turning the Titanic. And that is where, in 10, 20, 30 years' time, uh, false doctrine can be introduced. Uh, because, especially if um, leaders are not courageous enough to rout it out at the get go, um, it takes, it's almost like the church and the remnant churches need to be like a really healthy human body, um, like the body of Christ. And that it's not just up to our leaders, but up to uh, all clergy and all laity to be like white blood cells. Um, who can identify false teaching, error, uh, unbiblical behaviors even, and even attitudes, and uh, can actually 
seek those out, find them, and then remove them from the church. Because if we don't do that, we don't take the New Testament commandments to have church discipline that is structured around the Bible very for, for false teaching and bad theology very carefully and very strictly, then sadly you'll end up in the same place that the mainline denominations are in now. Uh, might be a bit of a delay, but I don't, I don't want a delay for the next generation. You know, it's selfish to think, oh, well, at least it's okay in the remnant churches for us now. Uh, things can turn very quickly if Satan sends infiltrators and we don't get rid of them. Uh, but even if it is something the next generation has to deal with, that is horrible. That is a very selfish, short-sighted way of viewing things. We're meant to be building God's kingdom under his grace. And, you know, I want my children, my grandchildren, and the, the, the kids and grandkids of the teenagers at my church to be able to look uh, at the Gafcon churches and say, well, thank God they stood firm and we haven't had any of that infiltration come into our denomination. Um, and, and they can actually be full of joy and have a safe harbor in this mad, mad world for generations to come. But I think generationally, not just in the moment. Anyway, uh, I, I think that there's wisdom there and, and there's, there's always a lesson to be learned from seeing other churches fall into error. And, you know, it's not just sort of pointing the finger and saying, ooh, bad apostasy, heresy, uh, which it is, but it's, it's also about saying, what can we learn to prevent this happening to us? And the devil's always looking for the next hot button issue to weasel in with. You know, it won't always be same-sex blessings. There'll be something else uh, which he'll infiltrate with. So we need to be careful, wise, godly, devout in our prayer, uh, dedicated to being watchmen on the wall, and uh, completely and utterly uh, devoted to the infallibility and inerrancy uh, and inspiration of the scripture as our sole rule of faith and governance. So those are my little thoughts on that. Um, the next story that we have is coming uh, out of the C of E again. This one is related to Mike Pilavachi and the sole survivor debacle. We're not going to go all back into that. It's very painful, but... Uh, the fallout continues. The Church of England uh, had an investigation into a retired bishop uh, because he was accused of not actually reporting allegations of abuse uh, that, uh, against Pilavachi. Um, so this is really sad to see. They've, they've concluded this investigation into this fellow, Bishop Graham Cray. Uh, he was the Bishop of Maidstone from 2001 to 2009. He also was a chairman at Soul Survivor and was its director from 20, 2000 to 2020. So very influential in this uh, movement started by Pilavachi. And um, this investigation has been uh, pretty thorough from what I can see. Um, and the conclusion uh, is that um, Pilavachi was seen as a spiritual sort of father figure to people. Uh, to these two pastors who've reported the, the failure for Bishop Cray to report the abuse or to deal with it properly. Um, they've been involved with Soul Survivor and under the sort of mentoring of Pilavachi from their early teenage years all the way through to growing uh, to leaders, leadership positions at Soul Survivor. Uh, the Church of England took the lead on the investigation in conjunction with uh, the Diocese of St Albans uh, with their safeguarding team and also the national safeguarding team to make sure that this was as transparent as possible. They looked into these allegations made against Mr. Pilavachi, but uh, over the course of three decades, but they also have now been looking into Bishop Cray. Um, you know, the spokesperson said uh, from Soul Survivor uh, said that um, those two folks who reported this had sh shown incredible courage in coming forward and sharing their experience. This must be so painful for the Soul Survivor and their church in Watford because they looked up to Pilavachi. They, they really thought that he was uh, a good and godly leader. And, you know, this is like the Ravi Zacharias thing. The 39 articles, again, guide us well. They say that the um, righteousness of a minister does not diminish the um, or, or invalidate the sacraments, which is a good principle to extend to uh, the preaching of the gospel as well. Uh, just because bad guys with bad skeletons in their closets do bad things and it's exposed doesn't mean that people who came to Christ through their preaching, their teaching, their ministry have somehow an invalid faith or that the church is somehow 
um, seen as evil. Uh, it, the church is a fallible organization here on earth. Uh, it's church militant here on earth, earth um, and it's, it's capable of being influenced by the devil uh, through the sinfulness of mortal men. But that does not change the uh, unchanging, totally perfect truth of the gospel. And if people came to Christ through Soul Survivor, because you know, thousands upon thousands of youth attended the, 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 um, the conferences, then uh, that does not mean that somehow their faith is tainted. That would be a, a terrible lie from Satan. Um, but it does mean there needs to be more transparency, there needs to be more accountability in all levels of leadership. And that applies to all churches, not just the Church of England. Uh, and that you know, you, it's dangerous to have a cult of personality. It's dangerous to have people who uh, try and keep things private and confidential, who try and censor uh, and silence free speech. It's very, very risky to have a culture of silencing people and putting things under the rug and sweeping things aside. Transparency in the short term, transparency and honesty are difficult. They require vulnerability. It can be hurtful, but it hurts the church more in the long term, it's more painful in the long term, and it hurts people, individuals who are survivors of abuse, if there's a culture in which abusers feel that they can hide uh, and manipulate um, structures to their own advantage. So I think that there are big lessons to be learned from this, and my prayers go out to the survivors. Those two pastors who stood up and spoke the truth, I mean, that, that re- frankly, that is... Um, that is incredible bravery. You, we, we should pray for them and for others who have suffered uh, at the hands of Pilavachi and at others like him. Uh, and we shouldn't just, you know, I'm, I'm the first to jump to criticizing the C of E, but we shouldn't just bag the C of E on this. This is something all churches need to be aware of. Um, and, you know, the significant cost to uh, people's spiritual and emotional well-being must be completely devastating for them to go through this and then to have to go through again reliving it all to report it Um, and it must have been so painful uh, uh, to report it and allegedly have it not dealt with uh, failing to pass on that information to the relevant safeguarding teams Um, it's it's very sad the conclusion of it all was that under the house of bishops guidance um, and then they're going to do appropriate risk management steps uh, but they can't say any more about the determination of their findings at this stage. I hope they come um, in the end. I know it's an active investigation at the moment, but I hope that their conclusions are made public because that will only uh, serve to increase a sense of distrust in the church if they don't. Uh, obviously, people's, as much as possible, uh, private and personal information needs to be protected, but in the very least, the, the determination for this Bishop Cray uh, and the wider investigation into Pilavachi should be made as public as possible. Because if we do things behind closed doors, it creates a very bad culture and stuff like this can actually take root. Uh, Related to this is um, the fact that Matt Redman and his wife Beth, who both served at Soul Survivor with Pilavachi uh, and actually Matt had been uh, friends with him and had been under his mentorship since he was a teenager um, have made a documentary called Let There Be Light on Matt's personal YouTube uh, channel. I hope and pray you actually check it out. It's only half an hour. It's a very harrowing harrowing watch. Um, and I want to uh, absolutely commend Matt and Beth for their vulnerability and their courage and their honesty in this. If we're going to build a culture in Christian churches where there is transparency and openness and honesty rather than backroom deals and silencing and censorship, then we need to be bold and we need to take um, that the seriously how vulnerable you need to be to make that happen. And wow, yeah, Matt and Beth were very, very courageous and I pray for God's richest blessings upon them. Uh, and in the course of this documentary, which now has 123,000 views in just four days on Matt's YouTube channel, uh, they speak to psychiatrists and psychologists, mental health professionals, about the impact that this has. But a huge takeaway from all of this, from the safeguarding investigation into Bishop Cray and from the documentary released by Matt Redman, uh, you know, who is really one of the, the greatest hymn writers of the 21st century, along with the Gettys, um, it's, it's that we just cannot afford to even slightly indulge that kind of 
culture or thinking. It's a very old-fashioned, outdated kind of thinking, and it needs to be obliterated uh, in the life of the church. <clears throat> okay, next story uh, is an international story. Uh, you may remember last year there were a spate of arson attacks on churches and Christian homes in Pakistan. 20 churches and 100 homes were set on fire, and uh, the government rounded up and arrested about 300 perpetrators for these terrible crimes. Well, uh, the bishop, a bishop, sorry, in Pakistan uh, has been really outspoken in criticizing the government and the corruption of the criminal justice system in the Muslim majority country. Bishop uh, Indrias Rimat has said that it's an absolute uh, travesty of justice because the uh, perpetrators who are arrested are slowly and bit by bit being released with no charges and efforts at rebuilding the churches have been very lackluster and weak and he appreciates that the government arrested them and made some attempt at justice but it seems they're just going to get away with it uh, and that is the problem in, in a country which has a lot of police and political corruption um, and that is a problem in a country where it is a, a ex seemingly culturally acceptable to persecute Christians so we need to pray for justice to be done, but we also need to pray for protection from, uh, for, the, for the Christians in that, that country because getting away with it always emboldens criminals. It always emboldens them to go and do more and do worse. So we need to be covering our Pakistani Christian brothers and sisters in a blanket of prayer. The last story I want to talk about today is... Um, uh, not particularly a church-related story, but I know many Christians will have a keen interest in it. It is to encourage you to pray for peace in the Middle East, as I know many of you are doing, uh, because um, President Biden says that it's sooner rather than later that uh, Iran is going to attack Israel, and this could easily escalate and spread beyond the Middle East. Uh, and Israeli um, intelligence sources are suspecting that it could happen within the next 48 hours or so. And people who live in the sort of border zone where aerial attacks are possible are terrified, are absolutely terrified. So uh, I feel that no matter what your view on um, the Israel-Gaza war is, that we need to be a people who are praying for peace, that the Prince of Peace would pour out his spirit upon that troubled region. Um, my prayer is that the true reconciliation of Christ would come between these warring parties, that the Jewish people would see that their Messiah uh, came 2,000 years ago and he is Jesus of Nazareth and that they place their faith in him for their salvation. Uh, and I pray that the Arabs would believe on Jesus and turn away from Islam. And I also pray uh, that the Christians caught up in the middle would be uh, able to set aside their cultural differences and actually put the kingdom of God first and evangelize and help those in need. It is a horrible situation. Uh, it's been absolutely devastating for the world to watch. With I've watched with absolutely a, a heartbroken horror uh, since the heinous October 7 terrorist attacks by Hamas. Uh, and it's so sad to see this happening. So please pray. The Bible enjoins us in Psalm 122 verse 6 that we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love you. So we need to pray, asking God to bless the Holy Land with peace, with protection, and that the um, aggressors would turn away from violence and warfare, uh, and that uh, the people of the Holy Land would be able to live and dwell in peace and that they would all experience the wonderful free, uh, free gift of salvation in Christ. Very sad situation, um, and we need to be vigilant in prayer, absolutely vigilant in prayer. I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that these are, could possibly be the events of biblical proportions that we are witching, witnessing unfold. My post-millennialist theology comes out there. Uh, I'm sure my uh, no, my pre-millennial millennial, pre theology comes out there. I'm sure my post-mill brethren would disagree, but I, I can't help but think that this might be something unfolding of scriptural significance. But we've got to pray either way. Either way, we've got to pray uh, because 
the Lord tells us to pray for people uh, in, caught up in war and to pray for uh, the hearts of kings. The Lord directs the hearts of rulers and we need to pray for the Holy Land because we're told to uh, by the Lord in the Bible. Right, my dear ones. Thank you for tuning in to this week's vlog. It has been an absolute privilege. Thank you for listening to this Aussie Presbyter ramble on as you do week in and week out. Uh, I think uh, some of the appeal that my little channel has, and I'm absolutely a nobody, uh, is that I just speak forthrightly, which is one of the gifts of being Australian. We are very straightforward. We're very straight down the line. We don't beat around the bush. We never call a spade a spade. We don't do that stiff upper lip thing that the Brits do. We just tell you what we think of you in no uncertain terms. And uh, I think that actually the world needs more of that. It needs Christians who are able, able to engage in the public sphere with courage and conviction and clarity and a boldness, an uncommon boldness uh, to simply stand on God's truth, to denounce evil and false teaching and to promote goodness and biblical faith. So uh, I thank you guys for tuning in. I, it blows my mind that we're edging in on 15,000 people. Yes, I will do at the 15K mark a Bible q and I, I, the feedback from asking if that was what folks wanted was phenomenal. So yes, I will. Uh, Lord willing that I live, I will do it. And uh, dear ones, um, a little update for my ministry at Emmanuel. Uh, we're going really well. Our Friday cafe yesterday was heaving with people. Uh, we've started a Hebrew class uh, with a retired professor uh, teaching us about 10 people in our parish how to speak and read biblical Hebrew, which is amazing. So cool to start with uh, the Old Testament, the foundation blocks of the faith, um, and to build that up uh, and to read that in its original language is an honor and a privilege, so glory be to God. Um, we're seeing new folks attend worship and folks uh, who are desperately seeking for healing, for forgiveness, for grace, for restoration, uh, and folks who are at rock bottom and are looking for the Savior are coming to Emmanuel. And that's the kind of church uh, we should be, a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. So we are going from strength to strength purely by God's grace. All glory be to Jesus uh, for what he is doing in us and through us. And we've even had a couple more people now say they're going to look at selling up their house uh, far away and moving close to Emmanuel or to Morecambe to worship at our church. So uh, it's very heartwarming to hear people do that because it means we must be doing something right. Uh, and I think the simple factor is we just speak the truth of the scripture in love, but with boldness and without compromise. And if we do that, uh, God will grow his remnant church, like I said earlier. If we muddle and compromise or we permit an attitude of cowardice or we try and silence other people who have the guts to speak up, even if we don't want to, then I think that will damage the growing Gafcon remnant churches and God will be not pleased with us. We want to be, as I told my people at Bible study when we began studying the book of Daniel this week, we want to be faithful in the midst of a pagan culture and we want to be operating in the center of God's will. And the way we know God's will is by knowing his word inside out. Hallelujah. So please keep praying for us. Satan is most definitely trying to tear down Emmanuel. Uh, he is most definitely trying to attack us. Uh, and please be in prayer uh, for us. We really, really need it. Um, but God is so much greater. He's so much more powerful. Um, and so we just continue on with the mission we have. As my friend Dr. PT says, just one more week at a time. We just keep pr plodding on with the gospel one week at a time. And God does the rest. Okay, my dear ones, uh, let's conclude with a prayer. I think it would be prudent for us to pray for the peace of the Holy Land. Gracious Father, we come before you now and with heavy hearts we pray for peace in the Middle East. We ask that you, Lord Jesus, would shed abroad your peace as the Prince of Peace, that warring nations would turn away from violence and bloodshed, that people truly would beat their swords into plowshares. Lord, we pray for your protection over the innocent people of Israel. We ask for you to hedge them in with your defense and protection from terror attacks. Lord, we pray that you would bless uh, the leaders of Iran to turn away from 
their aggression and their desire to do evil. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, for this war and these attacks not to happen, that you would stop these attacks from coming to pass. Uh, and Lord, we pray for, as we're commanded in the psalm, Psalm 122, the peace of Jerusalem. Please pour out your peace upon Jerusalem and the whole Holy Land, defending the innocent from harm. Lord, we pray for the Jewish people to become followers of Yeshua, their Messiah. Uh, they would become Messianic Christians and they would see that he has already been 2,000 years ago and he's coming again soon. And they would put their faith and trust in him for their salvation. And we pray for the Arabs and Muslims as well, that they would turn away from uh, false religion and come to believe in uh, Isa, Jesus Christ, as their personal Savior and Lord. They would see that the one true God is Yahweh, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that the awesome and glorious God, the triune Godhead, uh, is calling all people unto himself to choose Christ and live. Uh, and so, Lord, in the midst of this complex, volatile, and scary geopolitical situation, we simply pray for an end to violence and warfare and for peace to reign in the kingdom of Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you for watching the vlog, my dear ones. Uh, I'm excited because tomorrow is Sunday. I love the Lord's Day. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful Lord's Day at your local church. Uh, I will see you either in the next video, perhaps uh, I will see you on the live stream of our worship. I know a lot of people uh, only have apostate churches around them, so they go there to get communion, but then they watch our service to hear the word preached, which humbles me and moves me very deeply. Uh, so I might see you on the live stream at Emmanuel, or I might even see you in church. Because uh, the last four weeks running, we've had a number of YouTube subscribers come in and visit, which has been most amazing and quite a blessing. So thank you for watching. God bless you all and goodbye.